Good day. Uh, my name is Nicole Jaffermans. I'm an intensive care physician uh, working in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this PROCOM debate today, which is about uh, ICU management with the title Less is More, which may be a little bit surprising in terms of management styles. But of course, Less is More has become a very important um, uh, topic in intensive care medicine with less usually being more. But whether that is the case today remains to be seen. And I'm happy that we have two excellent speakers today with a lot of management uh, uh, experience. The first is Dr. Greg Martin. He is professor of pulmonary and critical care at Emory University in Atlanta. Um, and he is also research director and chair of critical care at Emory and will be the next president of the Society of Critical Care Medicine. The other speaker is Professor Daniel de Bakker, Professor of Intensive Care at the Brussels University, and he's head of the Department of ICU and the Chirex Hospital in Brussels, and he has been ESCOM past president. So thereby, I would like to give the word to Dr. Greg Martin, who will start off this profound debate. Thank you for joining me to talk about less is more, even in the ICU. This will be an exciting PROCON debate, and I'll talk about some of the clinical evidence that we have for less is more and how it actually may be used in critical care. I don't have any conflicts about this talk and I appreciate Nicole's introduction. So the first thing to remember is just because we can doesn't mean we should. There are many things that we can do in the ICU and in fact, sometimes we do, but it doesn't mean that we should do it in every patient every time. So in the US, we recognize that a substantial amount of the care we deliver, perhaps even up to one third of the kinship, the care we deliver is wasteful. And in fact, it's not just wasteful, it actually causes harm, physical harm, emotional harm, and even financial harm. And when you think about all those things together, it's very important because we spend time delivering high quality care, and that's our goal in the ICU, but we don't often think about the overuse of care and these things that are maybe unnecessary as potentially causing harm, but they clearly do. And as we review adverse events and other sentinel events that occur in critical care, we also need to be thinking about overuse as an equally, um, an equally dangerous issue that may be causing harm to our patients, our families, and even to our providers with ethical and moral distress. So one of the concepts to remember is therapeutic illusion. And therapeutic illusion is basically these concepts that say, we believe that there's something to be gained simply by providing a treatment or a new intervention. So there's an assumption, for instance, that patients and families expect us to do something. In fact, they sometimes think that doing more, more treatment and more testing is equated with more caring or a more effective care. And the idea that we could watch and wait, particularly in critical care where things are very time sensitive and patients are in distress and severely ill, watching and waiting may not be viewed safely and may not be considered effective. There's also, particularly in the ICU, the concern that we often get enamored or even drawn to new potential therapies before they're fully understood. And then in certain parts of the world, we see defensive medicine, which is another aspect of providing care, providing excessive care that may be beyond what's truly necessary. And finally, depending on the environment, but in the US, we see a lot of healthcare systems and even payers who might incentivize providing more care, even when that care may not be in the best interest of the patient. So what is the evidence behind less is more? And there are several examples of that. So even though critical care is a relatively young specialty, we've moved forward quite a bit in the evidence that we use for delivering care, but there's still many areas where we don't understand necessarily the best strategy. And we've often focused on things that would normalize the individual. So for instance, some of the earliest strategies we had for patients in the ICU was to remain at rest, to heavily sedate in terms of providing protection and rest, even normalizing strategies. So we would try and normalize hemoglobin or oxygen saturation in PaO2 and try and make sure that patients are both protected and normal when in fact normal is not necessarily correct or, or desirable in someone who's critically ill. So an example of that would be ventilatory strategies in ARDS where the traditional approach was really to prioritize acid-base balance and oxygenation over things like lung protection or even patient comfort. But now we realize that a low stretch approach, which has been around for 20 to 40 years now, that the idea that we prioritize lung protection is actually much more important. And this was very easily shown or very clearly shown 
in the ARDS network trial showing low tidal volumes to be superior. And in fact, they were not superior for gas exchange. Remember, these patients actually had, in some way, worse oxygenation and worse gas exchange. But in fact, they had better survival, more days li alive and free of mechanical ventilation, and less other organ failure. So low tidal volumes and doing more in a very real setting, actually less is more in this case. Now there's other things where you may say, okay, well, what about not just giving lower tidal volumes, but what about fluids? So we realize that fluids can also be adverse in patients and giving less fluids actually may be a desirable thing as well. So for instance, we've seen that more fluid is associated with um, greater mortality and it fucks and sometimes you see that greater fluid administration is associated, associated with more organ dysfunction. So the things that we might think that fluids would help with, like kidney injury, it actually doesn't, and it results in worse failure. Along those lines, we think about renal replacement therapy. And we've now seen very well-conducted randomized trials comparing earlier or later strategies of, of renal replacement therapy. And in general, there's no difference in survival, but what's remarkable is that the patients who are randomized and receive the later therapy often never need renal replacement therapy at all. So in this case, there was 50%, nearly almost exactly half of the patients who were in the late strategy never needed renal replacement therapy, which suggests that of those patients in the early strategy, many of them could have gotten by and would have been very well treated had they never re received renal replacement therapy at all. We also recognize antibiotic exposure as another consequence. So you can safely re, um, reduce or even eliminate antibiotics in some patients. And that has both potentially beneficial consequences for the patient, but also benefits for the ecologic culture in your ICU and for other patients in your ICU who are getting less exposure and less risk from um, resistant organisms, C. diff, and other complications of antibiotic therapy. We've also seen things that we do relatively routinely being shown very clearly not to necessarily be effective. So we often, over many years, have conducted or performed routine daily chest x-rays. And in this study, it shows that the yield from those, diagnostic or therapeutic yield of those, is less than 5% in terms of how often you find something important from a daily chest x-ray. And so they were in this study, they showed that abandoning those or eliminating those daily chest x-rays and really only performing x-rays for clinical reasons not only re resulted in a reduction in x-ray use, but it also re resulted in less expenditures and, and just as effective care. So it's clear that daily routine chest x-rays is something that we can reduce and eliminate even in the ICU. Now, there's also other things that we do that are quite extensive, like ECMO, that we are remaining, that we recognize as an important component of some patient care but what's interesting is that we have other strategies like prone positioning that has similar effects on oxygenation, but is often not used. So prone positioning is often considered well-proven, it's been studied in many trials and shown to be effective for improving oxygenation in mechanically ventilated and ARPS patients. And in fact, as you would imagine, it's quite inexpensive and easy to implement compared to things like ECMO. But yet we often will move to ECMO and use that first compared to things that are inexpensive well-proven and considerably less complex like prone position. So there are certain things that we've seen. So for instance, we've seen changes in ARDS mortality, or we've even seen changes in sepsis mortality, looking at these changes over time, either from our data or Jean-Louis' data, showing that patients are more likely to survive over many, many years. So what causes these changes we're seeing in critical care? And Mervyn Singer tried to answer that a number of years ago by saying in his ICU, what's made the difference? The answer is almost certainly less. It's less aggressive ventilation, less reliance on endotracheal intubation, less paralysis, less sedation, less use of drugs like Atomidate, but also less fluid loading, less blood transfusion, less antibiotics. A lot of these things that we were talking about that we've historically done, either because we felt that normalization was appropriate or we didn't have the standards in place to know what really was most beneficial to our patients. And now we recognize that actually doing less results in better outcomes and is really truly more. So there's a, there's a program called Choosing Wisely in the United States and the Critical Care Society's Collaborative has created five things that they recommend to do in order to really reduce waste and to provide effective care. So the first of those is not ordering diagnostic tests at regular intervals. That's an important thing that is unnecessary and not needed even in the ICU. 
We should not transfuse red blood cells in stable non-bleeding patients who have a reasonable hematocrit. crit. We should not prescribe parenteral nutrition in patients who are adequately nourished, certainly not in the first week of their stay. We should not deeply sedate mechanically ventilated patients without some very specific indication, without, in, without efforts to lighten that sedation. And finally, we should not consider life, we should not continue life support in patients at high risk of death without having really important conversations about comfort care and other strategies that take care of those patients, but without providing potentially the anxiety and the stress and the pain of the more invasive intensive care that we can offer. So sometimes not only is, is more not necessarily better, but sometimes less is actually a more effective strategy. And the barrage of tests and therapies should not automatically imply either better care or thoroughness or care. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I appreciate hearing the next concepts of what might justify more being more. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is uh, Daniel Becker coming from uh, Brussels and I will discuss indeed that uh, less is not always more. Um, and um, we just have heard a very interesting talk from uh, Greg Martin. And of course, there are several uh, studies that are well quoted in that uh, paper, in that um, uh, lecture. But however, we need to be very cautious about the message that less is more and that we should always do less because this is probably not always the case. And I was expecting indeed uh, my uh, uh, Dr. <laughs> to discuss about light, low tidal volume, less sedation, lower duration of antibiotics. But is it really less or is it just optimizing um, by minimizing the excesses when these occur? Because indeed, what it just shows is that we should avoid excessive tidal volume. We should optimize sedation and optimize the duration of antibiotics. But there is no idea that we should indeed do less in these conditions. And I will just show you a few examples, very precise examples, that uh, less may not always be the good way to go. And we you have to consider that arterial lines are invasive. And of course, it should be better to have uh, no arterial line and to go for fully non-invasive blood pressure monitoring. Just some example. Here, a comparison of um, 350 measurements of invasive and non-invasive blood pressure measurements. And globally, the bias is really quite good. Mineral bias, three millimeters of mercury, that's perfect. If we look at the limits of agreement, well, it begins to be a bit more complicated because indeed, a P millimeters per mercury, this begins to be a bit more complicated. But then we need to look at more details. In 70% of the cases, it seems to work well. I mean, difference of less than 10 millimeters, this can be really accepted. In 22% of the cases, it's the difference between 10 and 20. Well, this begins to be quite worrisome. And in nine, so close to 10% of the cases, a difference of more than 20 millimeter mercury. Wow, this begins to be really frightening. And the consequences of the errors of measurements may sometimes even depend on the pressure level. And if we look at the hypotensive patients here with blood pressure below 70 of mean arterial pressure, we can realize here that we have these patients here. And this begins to be really quite frightening because it is a positive difference. So the, in, the, non in, the invasive uh, is much lower than the non-invasive. And so this means that for these patients who are just at the borderline of uh, adequate blood pressure, the non-invasive give, give a very low blood pressure. This means that you will give more vasopressors, more fluids. So by doing less, you give, it is more. Yes, but it is more errors and more dangerous associated with more useless therapies. On the other hand, we have also these patients here, where we have indeed the invasive pressure who was very low and the non-invasive that was satisfactory in many cases. So it means that we will do less therapy and perhaps leading to more death. So this is something we need to be careful in these conditions because indeed this leads to major errors in management, unfortunately, by being less invasive. So 
less is more for arterial lines? Probably not, because it's less invasive is more unreliable, and less invasive leads to more errors. And that's not really what we want to have. So let's talk now about central lines. These are invasive. These are associated with infection. So, oh, we should prevent this. And this, there is a randomized trial. So where is the evidence? 260 patients randomized to central venous line or short, a true peripheral venous catheter. And these patients were really equally severe in both groups. And what's observed is that indeed there was some significant difference here in the complications. Yes, good. Oh no, because indeed there were more complications in the patient with uh, peripheral cath catheters, unfortunately. And so the number of major complications were even more significant with the patients with peripheral one. And so even pneumothorax were as frequent in the peripheral one than in the um, uh, central one. And more importantly, even when you look at the feasibility, they randomize a the patient, but for central venous catheter, it was provided in most of the cases, just in two patients, they were unable to insert the central line. However, with the peripheral one, well, in 20, so one patient every six patients, there was a failure to insert the peripheral vein. Oh. And more importantly, even when after many patients were crossed over to receive a central vein, because indeed these patients unfortunately had problems with the peripheral veins. So there was a 66 failure rate with the peripheral veins. Wow, quite a large number here, of course. And so the most important conclusion here was that these patients who can be managed either by a central line or peripheral line, the strategy based on systematic insertion of central line was associated with fewer complication. So indeed, more aggressive, less complication. That's exactly the reverse of what you may expect. So what about other therapeutic interventions? Here also it begins to be quite interesting because this is indeed one of the key trials showing that less is more less sedation, and you have more patients that can be weaned from mechanical ventilation, more patients that can leave rapidly the ICU. That's a very good concept. So perhaps if you look more at the literature, we can also see more recent data like this one. No sedation at all. Is it not less than less? Yes. Is it more effective? No, because indeed, exactly the same survival, exactly the same complications in both arms. So this seems not to be the case, showing that less is always better. Also, we can see here reducing vasopressors. We have heard that we that vasopressors are bad for us. Okay, so reducing exposure to vasopressors should be better. Indeed. Oh, the trial did not show this because indeed, the results were that there was no improvement in mortality. Ah, worrisome, yes. What about then ECMO? ECMO was say, oh, it seems to be something you should not use when you have the possibility to use something else. Okay, that's true. But then we look at the more recent trials. And the recent trials like the Eolia uh, by Alain Con, all patients or close to all patients were on prone position before being put on ECMO. And so they failed prone. And what we can see is that in recent meta-analysis, yes, there is an improvement in outcome, improving the mortality, sorry, of these patients. So this seems to be a very strong signal that in these patients, more is more. And even if we go for ECMO, VA ECMO in some other conditions like cardiac arrest and carrying shock, what you can see that indeed, yes, it favors the more. So the more aggressive support, the more chances your patient has to survive. Wow, oh, begins to be quite interesting and being inactive is perhaps not the best one. And the same is true for um, ECMO versus some other techniques that indeed like balloon, it's better ECMO than balloon in this condition. It's just ECMO compared to other cardiac support like Impella or Tandem Heart, which 
close to ECMO, that you have exactly the same identical survival. So this is more, it's a failed concept as such. I mean, it's not really the less that is always more for the patient because the debate should not be less, should we do less in most cases versus should we do more in most cases? Because this is really ridiculous. The best approach is individualization of care in our critical patient doing the optimal care for all. And for some patients, yes, it may be less, but for many others, it could be doing more that is the best solution for these patients. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Martin and Dr. De Bakker. You have given both excellent lectures um, with good content, but they are not compatible. So how to proceed? I would like to follow up on the, the last statement of you, uh, Dr. De Bakker, in which you actually say that it's all about, it's not about less or more, but about optimizing therapy. So my question would be, if we were to institute personalized medicine for the majority of the interventions that we do, do you think in general that we will do more or will we do less? First, Dr. De Bakker. <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, it's a very good question and I, I have no clear answer for this because it's really um, based on the assessment of the patient uh, at the bedside. And uh, even for a given um, disease, I, I cannot really state that we should always do more or should do always do less. But we, if we look for RDS, um, there is um, equal room for uh, less invasive uh, strategies using high flow oxygen um, um, uh, support for some of the patients as, as well as going for more invasive ventilation for the patient. And it will depend on the respiratory efforts, on the evolution of the patient, sometimes also integration of other factors like hemodynamic states and so on. So I think that's really the difficult task as a bedside indeed to individualize the therapy. But I don't think that as a whole, the unit should be um, aggressive or more aggressive because this is not very good word. I mean, I think I can be very aggressive in some patient and very limited aggressiveness in the other patients just because of the state of the patient. Okay. Dr. Martin? So it's, it is an important question and an, I certainly agree that we should be working towards individualized or personalized care. But I think the answer to the question is actually much more clear. It's, it's clear to me that we would be doing less. And part of that is because if you look at what we were doing 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we would all agree that we're doing things differently. And almost always it's less, where there's some things we're not doing at all. We're not doing renal dose dopamine, for instance, or some things that we realize is a failed practice. And there's a lot of other things that we're doing less of. And it sounds like Daniel would suggest that every patient in the ICU needs an arterial line because that's superior and a central line because that's superior, but also probably higher dose vasopressors and should be placed on a ventilator and placed on ECMO. And I realize that's not really what he's saying, but yet the, the idea of having a more invasive and a more strategy in every case, I think fails to recognize that there are things that we do that actually provide better care, both at the individual patient level, but even for us as providers, right? It results in better outcomes. So if we use less antibiotics, lower tidal volumes, less fluids, we actually do produce better outcomes. And I think the key that, that Daniel touched on, which is really important, is that individualized care, optimizing for the individual is what we're trying to do. It's important that conceptually, we've done a lot of things that were based on normalization or trying to make people look and feel or, or biologically and biochemically be normal. And that's not the right strategy. And that largely has produced doing less, but the key to doing it is actually doing what's right for each individual patient. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Dr. Bucker? Well, yes, I think that we should not take the perspective of history saying that we are now doing less for everything compared to what we were doing before. Remember what occurs to a patient with uh, acute myocardial infarction in the 70s. They put this patient in the bed in the ICU and hopes that the patient survive, just not doing arrhythmias. Now we are more aggressive. We do PTCA. We do a lot of support that we were not doing before. The same is true for uh, cerebral vascular accidents. Before, even we were not taking this patient in the ICU. Now we are very aggressive, thrombolysis, also thrombectomy and other things like this. The treatment of um, um, cerebral 
uh, aneurysm is also a much more aggressive nose than it was before. So I think that for some areas we are much more aggressive than we were from some other, we do indeed less aspects. We give indeed less sedation and perhaps less fluids than we were giving 30 years ago. Yes, less. But, you know, even if with the sepsis patients, if we take them from the ward and we don't do anything, the patient will not survive, right? Exactly. So, so Dr. Martin, we should do less, but how much should we do? Now, the key is to be following the evidence, right? So the things Daniel mentions are important because they were, they were done because we had new evidence that we could provide, for instance, thrombolysis for patients with stroke or acute MI, or the PTCA resulted in better outcomes. Now, you do have to realize that some of those things we actually did excessively, right? So we did more PTCA for a long period of time than we do now because we realized that there are other strategies that are equally or more effective. So again, the key here is to provide what's needed for each individual patient, but it's not necessarily, it's always being wary of being enamored by technology or thinking that simply because there is something we can do that we should do it. And that's where it's easy to fall into the trap. So it's not that we should be doing nothing. It's just that we need to be cautious and individual for therapy and do what's evidence-based. Right. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about monitoring. To me, the core of intensive care medicine is the, the ICU nurse at the bed and intensive monitoring, if you will. So um, this may generate a lot of measures. Um, should we monitor less, perhaps, with the ultimate uh, consequence, you know, having no ICU, perhaps? So it, it's hard to argue against monitoring less, except with the concept, as, as Daniel said, what if you're using it to monitor CVP? So if everyone has a central venous catheter and you're looking at CVP, I think we would all agree that CVP may not give you useful information, especially if you're thinking it's going to tell you about someone's volume status or their, uh, their likelihood response to fluids. You may be using it for fluid infusion. You might be using it for other reasons, and maybe that's valuable, just like an arterial line may be valuable. So I don't think we're, we're not trying to be nihilistic or think that there's nothing appropriate in monitoring, but we do need to think about what we're trying to accomplish with that. And there may be cases where arterial lines and central venous catheters are unnecessary and may result in more risk than it does benefit. Dr. DeBacher, anything to add? Well, I think that, uh, again, we should, uh, uh, probably be uh, individualizing the uh, monitoring intensity uh, according to, to the patient. And uh, uh, I still do use uh, PA catheters in, in, in significant number of patients, just because indeed it helps me to understand that to treat the patient, especially with a patient with right ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension. These patients, um, in my mind, really need the PA catheter in place to, to better treat these patients. On the other hand, if I just have a patient with uh, some um, septic shock rapidly responding to, um, to therapy, no, I mean, just an arterial line and uh, from time to time echoes may be um, just enough in these patients. So, mm -hmm. but it is not less monitoring. It is a different monitoring with uh, a number of views to these patients that are quite significant. And so it's just a tool that maybe sometimes be less aggressive, mm -hmm. but it's monitoring itself, which is less aggressive. And mm -hmm. some in my mind, people understand the things a little bit different and say, we should do, we do not need monitoring and we monitor less. This is not exactly true. We, you use some other surrogates to look at your patient. You look at times at the capillary field time. You look at the PVCO2 difference when you have central line and arterial lines. You do all these kinds of things that are less invasive, but still give you a lot of information to your patient. Mm -hmm. So I think um, most labs do a routine uh, laboratory uh, test in the morning, right? What would be your idea about that? Should that be more or less or? Hmm. So similar to chest x-rays, even in our clinical practice, we've begun to minimize daily routine laboratory testing. And it, at first I admit that felt awkward because we've got critically ill patients who are very dynamic and changing. But you often realize that just as we did with x-rays, if you get x-rays for clinical purposes and not as a daily order, you still end up getting x-rays. It's just that you're getting them because the patient became hypoxemic or someone heard a difference in breast sound or something. So we're still getting x-rays probably every second or third day. And I think you would end up doing something very similar, right? So the GI mm -hmm. bleeder, you're still going to be getting your serial hemoglobins. But the patient who is more stable and things you don't need to repeat all of their liver tests and their renal tests and their chemistries and their hematologic tests, 
every day. In fact, you can be more specific and individualize that for the patient as well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Debacher, anything? Well, nothing to add. I mean, I totally agree with the individualization of the um, prescription of the labs. You don't need a full lab every day for every patient. No lab is probably uh, unrealistic either. Uh, this patient should not be in the ICU at that stage. I mean, so it's a, but indeed, um, having some minimal core set of labs, including probably the uh, hemoglobin, platelets, and white blood cells, and probably um, um, uh, sodium, potassium, uric, creatinine every day, that's a minimal set. For the others, probably you, you need to adapt yourself depending on the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my, my last question would be about sedation. I never know, should I paralyze the patient and sedate them all over, or should I keep him awake? There are data either way. What do you feel about this? So the, the, this is a really good example where individualizing for the patient makes a lot of sense because we see a lot of patients who come in, people, particularly people who have, refract, have respiratory failure that they've had it before. Let's say they're a COPD patient and you're managing them with non-invasive or you've intubated them. Some of those patients do quite well with redirection and, and staff at the bedside and very minimal sedation. And other patients, particularly as they become more hypoxemic with ARDS, they may need paralysis, and with paralysis, it's the appropriate thing to sedate those patients so they're not, they're not paralyzed without any comfort or any anxiolysis. So I think you have to individualize this for each patient, but in general, the strategy of using less sedation actually seems to be quite effective. And as we've seen from some studies, you can actually get by with really almost no sedation in some patients. Okay. Well, I think with that, um, what was... I previously thought that your two lectures were incompatible, but I think we've reached out to each other and sort of agreed that um, the best way to go is to do something and that that something should be personalized and individualized. I would like to thank you, Dr. De Bakker and Dr. Martin, for your excellent talks and your great discussions. And with this, I would like to close the session. Goodbye. <laughs> thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.